Hi, I'm Greg LeBlanc and I'm here at the Haas School of Business with uh, John Elder, who is the founder of Elder Research and also the author of the Handbook of Statistical Analysis and Data Mining Applications. Welcome, John. Thank you, Greg. Good to be here. So, John, um, you've been doing data science for a long time and uh, something that's come up recently is the crisis of uh, reproducibility in mm -hmm. academic and particularly medical and scientific research. Um, this is something that you've paid attention to for uh, quite a while. Um, can you talk a little bit about what do you think drives this, this problem and, and why do you think it's uh, getting the attention that it's getting right now? Yeah, it's great that it's getting the attention. It really needs it. Um, the problem is very serious because all of science depends on reproducibility. You follow a recipe, you should get these results. And I likened it today, earlier for the first time, to the uh, the videos, I don't know if you've seen them before, have uh, nailed it. You know, you see if somebody creates a beautiful cake and then somebody else tries to get those results and gets this horrible result and they, 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 they post it under the, under the theme or the meme, nailed it. It's pretty hilarious. And that's what a lot of scientific results look like now. People try to reproduce a published result and they're just not getting the same result. And what begins to dawn on folks is that the original result may have been a cherry-picked result from multiple tries. And you have a, a mix of business problems as well as technical problems. The business problem is there's a lot of incentive to get good results. And I don't think fraud's occurring. I think it's just that a lot of people are doing it. A few people are getting good results. Those are the ones that are being published, and we know nothing about all the negative results. And then nobody ever stops when their first idea doesn't work, so they try other ideas, other ideas, other ideas, and eventually one works, and they publish that. And the statistical tests that are supposed to protect us from getting bad results are completely and woefully inefficient and insufficient for the, for the problem. So the part that I can have an effect on is a better statistical test, and that's what I've been trying to publicize, uh, really rediscovered some things that were proposed at the dawn of statistics almost 100 years ago and uh, weren't worked on because they didn't have computers. But now that we have computers, it's very easy to do in ways of accounting for the multiple tries and so forth that give you a much better idea of the true significance of a result. So I've been trying to get the word out there to really help the science because the problem is, is so great that it's possible. I, I'm of the belief that something like 95% of the medical results published are fake results. They do not have true science behind them. Optimists think only half the results are bad. Pessimists like me think it's more like 19 out of 20 results that are published are bad. And one, one of the things is that people who have a, a smattering of statistics, um, they, they understand what a p-value is. And so, you know, when you're communicating results, you can, you can talk about the p-value. Um, and uh, there's a lot of assumptions that go into that, uh, and there are a lot of constraints that would make that, uh, in order to do a proper test that would make that meaningful, uh, those, those constraints are often not adhered to. They are, and the p-value is sort of a magical formula that a non-specialist would use. I mean, folks that are not specialists in data analysis, um, they're specialists in chemistry or biology or whatever they're working on, they have this horrifying, terrifying formula at the end that they have to use that they have to meet its constraints. And if they do, they get to publish, and if they don't, then, so the stakes are high, the understanding of the underlying mechanism behind the formula is not great, uh, but the formula really is, is meant to say, how likely could a certain, how likely could you have gotten that result by chance, but if you tried it one time? It doesn't really cover if you tried it multiple times, if you tried lots of different variations, which of course is what you do in science. You, you, uh, you keep going back and hitting the problem from lots of different things. I mean, Edison at one point said, I've tried a thousand, I haven't found how a light bulb will work, but I've tried a thousand things that don't work. You know, and, um, and so we, we reward persistence and we, and we reward creativity. But if we could account for all those things that we tried, then we would have a better understanding of our true significance in uh, how likely a result could have a result this interesting could have arisen by chance, and so under certain circumstances there is a way to account for that that I'm trying to publicize uh, that is relatively straightforward. Target the target shuffling method. So um, a couple of years ago, McKinsey came out with a study that said that uh, uh, data science is going to be a very scarce skill 
um, in short supply, and people are going to be desperately looking for data scientists. Um, I think part of that has been alleviated, and, and, and I think now you, you might agree that the skill that's in shortest supply is, is, is common sense. <laughs> so, <laughs> arguably, that's, that's been true for a long time. I, I mean, yeah, it's been called the, well, it's been called the sexiest uh, job in the 21st century, and, and I, I wonder, have they seen any data scientists, you know, <laughs> when they said that? But, you know, it's really a fantastic job. I've been so fortunate to be in the field for 22 years now as a full-time data science consultancy. We have about 70 people in our company. Um, and so as it got attention of starting a few years ago, I guess the oldest degree program is about a decade old now. I think it's in North Carolina State started a master's program 10, 10 years ago. And they've got a great program and about 100 other programs that started up. This morning I got an email about an undergraduate program starting somewhere. I can't remember exactly where. But um, it's a lot harder, by the way, to start an undergraduate program because you're fighting with other programs for the same number of undergrads. It's a lot easier to add a master's program at a university politics-wise. So that's why they start. But, you know, with all that supply and with all the uh, advertising about what a great uh, degree it is, a lot of people are moving into the field, a lot of people are rebranding themselves. Um, and so I think the supply of people claiming to be data scientists may have outstripped even the demand. So I noticed uh, recently the average wage has actually gone down because it's gone from a data scientist as this unicorn having all these unique skills in one person to people realizing that you can have a team and people can have more specialized skills and you don't need to have uh, you know, extremely highly paid rare individuals. You can piece together a team from more commoditized specialists, um, which is certainly makes sense. Data science <laughs> together, John. <laughs> Great.